Welcome to Worship for the weekend of October 16th and 17th, 2021. My name is Lindsay Beaulieu, Director of Operations here at First Presbyterian Church in beautiful Morganton, North Carolina. Thank you for joining us online for worship today. We're so glad that you're here with us. Those of you who worship online with us are an important part of our ministry at FPC. So we want to connect and get to know you. If you would, we'd love for you to take a few minutes to like this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and follow the link at the bottom of your screen to our website, and click the button that says connect with us. We would love to meet you and learn how we at FPC can walk alongside you. Know that you're welcome here with us, and I pray that you'll encounter God as you worship with us today. This week, we hear a special message from Sarah Scoggin at Hopewell Presbyterian Church in Huntersville, North Carolina. She'll continue our sermon series titled, Upside Down. Jesus taught that the kingdom of God is quite different from the world in which we know. Much of life seems to be about how much money we can make, how high we can climb the ladder in our careers, the legacy of greatness that we leave behind. While the world clamors for and celebrates the greatest, the most wealthy, the most powerful, the kingdom of God celebrates the least of these. It protects the poor and it uplifts the powerless. Throughout the gospel accounts, Jesus taught his disciples that the kingdom of God is upside down. It flips the conventions of this world and changes the scorecard of a life well lived. For the next few weeks, we'll be studying Jesus' words from Mark chapter 10. They aren't always easy to hear, but I believe that they teach us about what life in the kingdom of God ought to be like. I pray that you'll be blessed today. Let's be called into worship using the words of Psalm 104. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty, wrapped in light as with a garment. You stretch out the heavens like a tent. You set the beams of your chambers on the waters. You make the clouds your chariot. You ride on the wings of the wind. You make the winds your messengers, fire and flame your ministers. You set the earth on its foundation so that it shall never be shaken. O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Let us pray. God of majesty, we are constantly surrounded by your gifts and touched by your grace. Our words do not approach the wonders of your love. Send forth your spirit that our lives may be refreshed and the earth may be renewed until the new heaven and the new earth resound with the song of resurrection in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Church, join me as we lift our voices together and praise our God in song. Oh, 
Our first reading today comes from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 53. In this Old Testament passage, Isaiah delivers a prophecy about the coming Messiah and the suffering he must endure. This passage might sound familiar as it's applied to Jesus often throughout the New Testament, particularly during the Easter season. This suffering servant passage from Isaiah is difficult, but it reveals to us the heart of God's great love for us. It also alludes to Christ's future embodiment of the teaching, that he will come to serve rather than be served, and will give his life as a ransom for many. Hear with me the word of God from the New Living Translation. Yet it was our weaknesses that he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment for God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shears, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream, but he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone. But he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life, and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all their sins. I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for the rebels. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hi, friends. My name is Sarah Scoggin. I am from Hopewell Presbyterian Church, and it is a pleasure to be here with you today. The passage from our first reading reminds us that Christ bore our sins on the cross. Because of his death, it is possible for all of us, free from sin, to live for righteousness. And so, trusting in God's grace, we freely confess our sin to God, who is faithful to forgive. We will pray together using the prayer on your screen, followed by a brief moment of silence, for your personal prayers. Church, let us confess together. Merciful God, in your gracious presence, we confess our sin and the sin of this world. Although Christ is among us as our peace, we are a people divided against ourselves as we cling to the values of a broken world. The profit and pleasures we pursue lay waste the land and pollute the seas. The fears and jealousies that we harbor set neighbor against neighbor and nation against nation. We abuse your good gifts of imagination and freedom of intellect and reason and turn them into bonds of oppression. Lord, have mercy upon us. Heal and forgive us. Set us free to serve you in the world as agents of your reconciling love in Jesus Christ. Hear now the prayers we lift to you in the silence of our hearts. The scriptures declare that the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. The time has come at last. Now is the day of salvation. Hear the good news because of God's love and mercy through Jesus Christ. I can declare with full confidence that your sins and mine are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Amen. 
Today's sermon comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 35 through 45. It says, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Church, thank you for your warm welcome. My name is Sarah Scoggin, and I am the Director of Christian Education and Youth at Hopewell Presbyterian Church in Huntersville. I'm married, and my husband, Drew, and I have two lovely children, Gwendolyn and Jonah, ages 9 and 10. I haven't always been a youth minister. For many years, I was a teacher. I have taught kids from preschool age through middle school. Middle school was my happy place as a teacher. A majority of my time was spent in a middle school math classroom before I sensed God's nudge to pursue ministry. That's an incredibly long story for another time. I am a second, almost third year student at Union Presbyterian Seminary, and I am in the dual degree program, headed towards a master's in divinity and a master's in Christian education. I'm so honored to spend some time with you today as we continue to explore the upside down. Jesus in these passages in Mark literally turned the entire world order upside down where the last would become first. Up to this point in Mark, the disciples had been traveling with Jesus and listening to his teachings. Jesus found quiet places in which to gather the disciples and shared with them his coming passion twice. And then in the verses just before today's passage says, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. They will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit upon him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise again. For the third time, he tells his disciples what was about to unfold, and again, The disciples just don't get it. You may also know James and John as the sons of thunder, and they make this misunderstanding even more glaringly obvious. After hearing of the passion that would soon follow, they turn to Jesus and in my interpretation say, "Uh, Jesus, after you're done with that, uh, could you give us the best seats in paradise? Today we live in a me first, I'm the best world. Think about the beginning of the pandemic. I remember hearing stories of people literally fighting one another for rolls of toilet paper. It's mine. It belongs to me, not you. Or think about kids when they learn to draw when they're little. They do so with wild abandon. This scribble is a dinosaur. This boxy square shape with a triangle attached that is absolutely a giraffe. And as they grow up, many of them pack away the crayons and the markers. And when asked why, they say, no good at that. If we can't be the best or the greatest, there is the tendency to give up, to pack it up and to move along. If you've hopped on any form of social media lately, you know that the greatest, the best, the me first doesn't just stop there. Psychology Today notes that while social media connects us to others, it actually can lead to a greater sense of self-centeredness. Social me, me, media. It's rare to see true authenticity on social media. What you more often find are these snapshots of a moment in time in which we've captured our perfect vacation, our picture-perfect children, 
our perfectly tidy homes or that picture perfect selfie. You can even find statistics today on selfie related injuries and deaths. For those of you that may not know, a selfie is just a picture that a person takes of themselves. The United States Department of Transportation found that 4% of all drivers admitted to taking selfies while driving. In India, from 2014 through 16, there were at least 54 deaths while taking selfies, prompting the development of selfie danger areas in an attempt to deal with the number of deaths. There have been selfie-related deaths worldwide, but they are prominent in India and in the United States. In the research I did for this sermon, I encountered story after story after story of tragic death as the result of taking a selfie, some in front of moving trains or on cliffs or while driving. It's easy to see that we live in a culture that revolves around individualism and self. Our Sons of Thunder demonstrate this me first attitude as well. You don't get the name Sons of Thunder for nothing after all. James and John were rough hewn guys. They were not ones to back away from confrontation. They were fiery, aggressive men. They wanted to call down fire on the people of Samaria on one occasion, if you remember that story. And here, they asked Jesus to do what it is that they want him to do. Imagine Jesus and his loneliness as he considers that Jerusalem is stretching out before him. He has told those most near and dear to him in the world that his death is imminent. And not only that, but that he would suffer a death of humiliation and agony. He has told them three times now of what will happen to him, and they just don't get it. And not only that, but James and John are more worried about themselves and being acknowledged as the right-hand man and the left of a king than they are of the impending death that Jesus was obviously grappling with. And the other 10, they grew angry because James and John had beaten them to the punch. They were jealous. They don't get what Jesus is trying to teach them. Jesus then tells them that they don't know what it is they are asking. He says, are you able to drink the cup that I drink? or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And James and John respond with, we are able. This cup that Jesus speaks of is the cup that we hear in Luke. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Baptism in Greek sometimes re refers to a flood of calamities. It can refer to an almost submersion near drowning as water closes in overhead. Though as we first read this text, we bring to it the familiarity of the sacraments. What Jesus meant is much more grave. In their response of we are able, do James and John really know what they are getting themselves into? I'm willing to guess they don't. After all, knowing what we know about Jesus' crucifixion, we don't find James and John being crucified alongside Jesus to his right and to his left. Instead, we find two criminals. James and John were willing to follow Jesus into glory, but were they willing to follow him to the cross? Jesus again tries to set the disciples straight by saying, whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The first must become last. This was unthinkable to James and John and the disciples, and it's unthinkable to us even today. It's difficult to conceive a reality different than what we're accustomed to. We have a top-down understanding of leadership, but what is required by Christ and for transformation in this world is that we be transformed from beneath a world carried on the shoulders of people willing to serve one another in love. We must take the role of a servant to allow God the room to do his work. There is a strange bike race that took place in Eugene, Oregon in 2015 called the World's Shortest Bike Race. The race is 13 feet in length 
a whole lot shorter than the Tour de France. Bikers line up at the starting line and they must go as slow as they can without putting their feet down. Imagine that you are new to this event and you sign up thinking, ah, a super short race, this will be an easy win. You show up to the starting line and at the go, you take off, you fly through the finish line in a matter of seconds. And as you do, you realize, yes, I've won. You stop, dismount, turn around, and you see that all of those behind you are inching along to the finish. You didn't realize that the rules were different here. Not only have you not won, but you've come in last. Isn't our pursuit of greatness a little bit like that? The world tells us it's all about me. It's all about getting first place and being the best. We work and work. We slave away at our jobs to get ahead, to earn ourselves positions of prestige and power. We chase after wealth and prosperity and comfortability. And when we have a taste of that, we desire for more. We are winning. We're winning. And then we stop and we look back and we realize that we didn't understand the rules of the race at all. We've missed the point. In our me first, I'm the best, life can become hazy in our pursuit of greatness. We often fail to realize that the measuring stick of this world is different than the measuring stick of God's. Jesus changes the rules of the race that we're used to. He turns things completely upside down. We think greatness is about being first when Jesus tells us greatness is about being last. We think greatness is about having a position of power where we can be served, but Jesus tells us greatness is about being a servant. Take a moment, church, in your mind. Think of that person in your life that has made all the difference. Those that in your mind are truly great. Do you see them? I'm willing to guess they aren't famous basketball players. A president, an actor, an actress. I'm willing to guess that they are the people that showed up for you. The people that love you. The people that sacrifice to make sure that you are cared for and that you are heard. They are the truly great ones. It can be really easy to get caught up in today's world of being the greatest and doing the best when really Jesus isn't concerned with any of it. Jesus, the Son of Man, came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Donald Jewell sums it up beautifully when he says, In the shadow of the cross, we get a brief glimpse of a new community in which relations are not governed by power and status, but by service and hospitality for those without status. A community in which those who have been ransomed live for others. A world upside down. Amen.
Let us affirm our faith together with the whole church using the words of the Apostles' Creed. So church, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Church, the tithes and offerings that you generously give each week are used to further God's work right here in Morganton and Burke County and beyond. By giving so freely to God, you're blessing those in our community in tangible and in life-giving ways. Thank you for your faithfulness and for choosing to worship God through your giving. And so I invite you to give your tithes and offerings using the link at the bottom of your screen, or you can send them to our church office in person or through the mail. Our offering is an act of worship in which we express our gratitude and reliance on God. With joy, we offer our gifts to God as a sign of our deep devotion and our covenant faithfulness. Together, let us prepare our hearts to give with generosity and with joy. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give our best, lest in gaining the world we lose life itself. As a covenant people, we seek to witness your will and your way. Help us to know more clearly what you would have us to do with the resources entrusted to our care. As we contribute to the needs of your people, we present ourselves as living sacrifices through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. God calls us to be a praying people. Let us join in prayer, offering our praise, thanksgiving, and intercession to God. O oh, great God, glorify yourself in all the earth. Be glorified in creation. Be glorified in your church. Be glorified in our worship here today. We magnify your name. Help us to make your name and the nature of your grace larger and easier to see. Help us to live and worship in such a way that we become like a magnifying glass through which our coworkers and children and friends can see you come into focus in ways that they may have not seen before. When people ask for an explanation of the hope we have, give us the words to answer thoughtfully and well. When people wonder aloud who Jesus is and why he matters, help us to reply in words that will echo the sweetness of your gospel. Father, ours is a world that could use more glimpses of your glory and fewer glimpses of the hell to which our sin so easily leads. Ours is a world that needs more of the gentle words of your son Jesus and fewer angry words coming from our mouths. We need your glory, O oh God, so that we can aspire to be more like you and less like the selfish, self-indulgent creatures we have become in our sin. We need the glory of your grace in a world bent on revenge, the glory of your truth in a world in love with lies, the glory of your holiness in a world filled with tawdriness, the glory of your resurrection life in a world mired in death. Make us transparent to you so that because of your spirit at work in us, this world can become a better place, a more kingdom-like place, a shalom place. Bless, Father, this congregation. Heal those who are ill, comfort those who mourn, reassure those who feel troubled and frightened by what the future may hold. Bless the leadership of this congregation, the elders, deacons, and the staff. Be with all of us as we continue to worship with you now and as we prepare for the week ahead. 
as we continue to worship, fill us with yourself. Be glorified in all we do. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May the love of God, the abiding grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen.